Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nahmaduhu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afiru. Wa na'uzu billah min shiruri anfusina. Wa min sayyi'ati amalina. May yahdihillahu falamudillala. Wa may yudlil falahadiyala. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la. Anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanutuku allaha haqqa tukatihi. وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّا إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ أَتَّقُوا رَبُّكُمُ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدَةٍ وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ حَكِيمًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ مَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا Amma ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters, all thanks and praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek Allah's help and His forgiveness. And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. And whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu is His servant and His messengers. Alhamdulillah, I am extremely grateful to be here once again to reflect with you on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today I'd like to share with you some reflections on one of the Asma ul Husna. And Asma ul Husna is the name we give to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Arabic. So the attribute I'd like to talk to you about today is Al Muqsit. And Al Muqsit means the equitable. And before I start diving deep into this name, I do want to highlight that there is a difference in the scholars with respect to the 99 names of Allah or Asma al-Husna. And in the Quran, we have 81 attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are explicitly mentioned. And the remaining 18 vary from, the scholar, from one scholar to another. Now, the difference isn't large, um, but there is a difference present there. I just want to just highlight that uh, quickly because this is one of the names that differs from one list to the next. So the list that I use for the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one from Imam al-Ghazali. Um, and this attribute al-Muqsid appears in this list. And if you're not aware, Imam al-Ghazali is a huge towering figure in Islamic um, history. And he was somebody who was born in the 11th century. And Imam al-Ghazali was not only a scholar, he was a, a, a well-renowned theologian and also a mystic. So people would call him, he was, one of, from, he was one of the great Sufi scholars as well. And he was revered not just for his intellectual prowess, but also for his uh, spiritual depth. And even to this day, Al-Ghazali's influence is just, um, you know, transcends all religious boundaries. And his legacy continues to shape the discourse that we have, at least today, in, in, uh, on the topic of Islam, as well as even on the topic of Sufism. So some of you may wonder, you know, why is there a difference of opinion, meaning that those 18 names, why is it that there's a difference there between the scholars? So let's keep in mind that all the scholars who studied the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have done so with references to the Quran and to the Ahadith. So those are our sources of knowledge for these Asma al Husna. So from the Ahadith though, there's a weak Hadith uh, that I found that appears in Sunan Abid, Ibn Majah. Um, that mentions the Prophet ﷺ describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having 99 names. And then there's a list of these 99 names in that hadith. Now, I do want to again emphasize that this is a weak hadith. The scholars agree that this the chain uh, or the isnad of that hadith is really weak. But it is mentioned, it is, it is there in the collections of um, uh, Ibn Majah. Um, uh, but when we call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we say, Ya Allah or Allah, we're calling Allah by his proper name. So like you and I have proper names, this is Allah's proper name is Allah. And, you know, when we when we talk about the Asma al-Husna, we're talking about the attributes or the adjectives that describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these attributes um, are identified with a thorough examination by the scholars using the Quran and using the Hadith. So while 81 of these are explicitly mentioned and identical in all the lists you would find out there, the 18 do differ. They also differ in the order of these attributes. So it's not to say one is more important than the other just because it came before, but there is a difference 
uh, in the in the order in some of these you know different scholars you know which which might make one to wonder is there one scholar's list that is better researched or maybe you know better supported than the other uh, I don't think there's any evidence out there at least I didn't find any evidence so the answer to me is no there isn't any difference you know because at the end of the day you know it should be enough for all of us to know that all of these lists describing Asma al Husna are there to help us understand and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the intention of all of these are to help us apply those learnings to our own personal lives. Now, some scholars like Imam uh, Qayyim al Jawziyah, for example, uh, he might describe the attributes more from the lens of an academic, while somebody like Al Ghazali might explain uh, the attributes with an attempt to apply those learnings to our daily lives by connecting not just the the intellectual, but also the spiritual. And that uh, is typically what I find you know, from the work of Al-Ghazali. So with that you know, out of the way, let's start talking about the attribute Al-Muqsid. Now, as you hear the meaning of Al-Muqsid, the equitable, equity has a relationship to justice as well. So you might wonder, is this in any way related to the attribute Al-Adl, which is another one of the Asma Husna, and Al-Adl, also, like al muqsid uh, differs. It's one of the 18 names that the scholars differ on. But both Al-Adl and al muqsid appear in the list um, produced by Imam Al-Ghazali. Um, so while al muqsid seems like it's similar to Al-Adl, the two are not the same. So let's start breaking down, at least linguistically first, the root words uh, of al muqsid And the root words for al muqsid are Qaf, Sin, and Ta, uh, which can be pronounced as Kist. So the meaning of this root word is to act or deal justly or fairly and to establish equitable balance. Now the word kist, if you say it by itself, means an installment in a series of installments. But let's focus more on, on the word itself. So um, al-adl and al muqsid slight difference. Adl is justice for everyone. And we all desire to have uh, you know, justice received as well as justice done. So we all want to live, we have, we all have this desire to live in a society that offers and enforces rules that are fair and just. So as a country and as a community, you know, we create laws that are meant to apply to everyone equally, you know, um, and justly. However, just because a law is created with justice in mind doesn't mean that it is equitable. So why is that the case? How can that be? How can a law be uh, just but not equitable, because we cannot create laws that provide equity in every single circumstance. So with the rules that we create as people, we can make sure that we are fair to everyone and form those laws based on that sense of fairness. But it's not the same as equity. So let's let's pick a concrete example that will help us try and understand the difference between justice and equity. So for example, we all know that if we wanted to operate a motor vehicle or a car on public streets, at least in the United States, we need to obtain a driver's license. Now, without a driver's license, we would not be legally operating a motor vehicle. To obtain this driver's license, there is a requirement. There's a set of requirements you have to complete. One of those requirements is that you need to study a course or at least the material that will tell you about the rules and regulations what do the signs mean and how to identify them? And then once you understood this material, there's a written exam. And this written exam then allows you to obtain a permit that says, okay, you're now ready to learn how to operate this motor vehicle. And all of this work that we do is effectively to make sure that everybody in our community has the same basic understanding of the rules when they operate that vehicle and also understand the consequences that come along with breaking those rules. Now, the consequences may differ from one state to another, um, but that's a whole other thing. But the point is that there is a, a, a consequence. Um, so the consistent part of it is that as long as we all know what the, what the signs are, what the rules mean, and we all know that there is a consequence for breaking those rules, we're all good. So once you finish uh, the exam, you have a learner's permit, you then now learn how to drive. Once you learn how to drive, you then get this little you know, driver's license that says, okay, now you're eligible to legally drive on the roads in the, on the public street. So 
in every step of the way, when we get the learner's permit, when we get the driver's license, there's a fee associated with it, a small nominal fee that the government charges to provide that service. Now, let's say, for example, that we have two drivers and both of those drivers are caught operating a motor vehicle without a driver's license. So two drivers, no driver's license, both of them caught. The first driver happens to be a wealthy individual. And the second driver is somebody who comes from a, uh, who has lower income and doesn't have a steady job or income. Now to be just, the law will likely levy the same fine on both of those drivers for operating the vehicle without proper uh, permitting permission or license. So the law is gonna apply equally to both of them. However, the law is not equitable because the fine will disproportionately impact the lower income person than the wealthy individual. So while the fine might be the same, it will the pinch will be much harder for the one who is of lower income um, if we just take the law and just applied it as it is. So the wealthy individual, you know, if, if we say, okay, you know, you pay the fine, now you have to go get a driver's license. The wealthy individual will likely be able to make the time, pay the fees necessary, learn the material, and then go ahead and, and complete the process for getting a driver's license. While the lower income individual, this person may actually need to drive just to get paid so that, you know, they can sustain themselves and maybe there are other family members that they're helping sustain. So to be equitable in this situation, the law would have to be tailored specifically for that lower income individual. So for example, one way that this could happen is that whoever's um, you know, doling out that punishment, the judge, for example, could say, we're gonna give an alternative penalty for this low income individual to save them from any undue hardship that will materialize for them because of this particular um, you know, violation. So that supported measure for the low income individual to address this is being equitable, but it is different from the justice that would be applied to both of these individuals. So from this example, what we understand is that there is a difference between justice and equity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages us to be just to one another. And there's an authentic hadith uh, narrated by Umar ta'ala anha and recorded in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet sallallahu said, in the in the lahi ala manabiri, min nurin an yamini rahmani azzawajal. The dispenser of justice will be seated on the pulpits of light besides God, on the right side of the merciful, exalted, and glorious. And, you know, what the Prophet Sallallahu is telling us that, you know, who are these dispensers of justice? You know, the, the muqsateen. So the Prophet Sallallahu is using this as a teaching moment. The muqsateen can be the officially appointed judges who are responsible for enforcing the law justly and equitably. There are also people like you and I who dispense justice in the affairs of our families, including our spouses, including our children, including our parents, even our extended families or community members or work colleagues. So for example, it is possible for me to be unjust. If I choose to give a gift to my son and not give the same gift or different gift to my daughter that's appropriate. So in that case, I am being unjust to my children. So that is a form of injustice as well. So the gift I choose to give my son, for example, without consideration of my daughter, that is the injustice. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared men and women to be equal in the Quran. You know, we can find this in, in multiple places. So if I choose to favor one over the other, then I am disobeying the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of the verses, you know, for example, to highlight on this point is you know, we can find it in Surah Al-Ghafir where Allah tells us, Woman amila saliham min zak min zakarin aw anfa wa huwa wa huwa mu'minun fa ulaika yadhulun al jannah. Whoever does good, whether male or female, and is a believer, they will enter paradise. So in this verse, Allah is telling us that believers who do good, whether they're male or female, will enter paradise. So Allah is drawing a distinction that if you're a believing male, then you get you know, a multiple of 10. 
or any multiple whatsoever. There is no distinction. The last thing is your men and women are both equal, and there's no distinction except for the deeds that we do. So if I choose to draw the distinction, then my bias goes against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I would be committing a form of injustice. Now, let's say my son does something that is incredible and absolutely worthy of recognition with a gift. That is a different matter altogether, because in that case, I would be, record, I would be rewarding the outcome of his efforts and not showing bias towards him over my daughter. So I would be acting in a, in a way uh, justly. And similarly, if I'm at my workplace and I choose to favor, let's say, only my male colleagues or only my direct reports or only my bosses over others, then I would be committing also another form of injustice in my dealings at work because I'm not treating everyone equally and fairly. So favoring one people over another, despite everybody being equal, is the form of injustice uh, or is a form of injustice. So the dispensation of justice in fair and equitable manner is a responsibility for us as Muslims. So my dear brothers and sisters, you know, we must remind ourselves that being Muslim, calling ourselves Muslim, you know, in Islam, we are called to action and not to philosophical meanderings. So al muqsid is an example of calling us to be just and equitable. In another authentic hadith recorded in the Tirmidhi, you know, Umar al anha reported that our Prophet sallallahu said, the Muslim is a brother of the Muslim. He doesn't oppress him. He doesn't put him into ruin. And whoever is concerned for the needs of his brother, Allah is concerned for his needs. And whoever relieves a Muslim of a burden, Allah will relieve him of a burden from the burdens of, a day, of the day of judgment. And whoever covers the faults of a Muslim, Allah will cover his faults on the day of judgment. So Imam al-Ghazali you know, tells us that al muqsit is he who demands justice for the wronged from the wrongdoer. So I'll say that one more time. al muqsit is he who demands justice for the wronged from the wrongdoer. So the perfection of al muqsit lies in the linking of satisfaction of the wrongdoer to the satisfaction of the wrong. So how is that possible? So Allah is the only one able to satisfy the plight of the one wronged and the plight of the one who is the wrongdoer. So to understand this better, you know, we can look at it in uh, another authentic hadith reported by Anas radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, and what was reported is that while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sitting, uh, Anas reports that while Rasulullah sallallahu was sitting, uh, we suddenly saw him smile so much that his front teeth, his incisors were showing. And Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha asked him, what has caused you to smile, O Rasulullah? And Rasulullah sallallahu replied, two men from my ummah kneeled before Allah. And then one of them said, O Allah, take on my behalf my brother to task for having oppressed me. And Allah then said to the one seeking retribution, what will you do to your brother while not a single good deed of his remains? So his two brothers in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of them, is asking for retribution. The other one who is who did the wrong has no more good deeds. So the one who is seeking retribution at that point replied, oh Allah, then he should be made to carry some of my burdens, some of my sins. So at this point, Anas um, replies that Rasulullah starts crying. There's tears flowing out of his eyes, you know, after after making that that comment. And Rasulullah then continued and said, Indeed, that day is severe. And, and he's talking about the Day of Judgment, all of mankind will need their burdens to be carried for them. That is, they will be in great desperation and severe need for someone to assume for them the burden of their sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says to the one seeking retribution, lift your gaze and look in the gardens of paradise. So the one seeking retribution at this point raises his head and says, oh Allah, I see cities and castles of gold ornamented with pearls. Which prophet is this for? Or which extremely truthful person is this for? Or for which martyr is this for? And at this point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, this is for the one who gave the fee. And the one who was wrong asked, oh Allah, who has that amount to give? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies, you possess it. 
So the one seeking retribution at this point is absolutely perplexed and says, what do I possess that I can give for this spot in Jannah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies, by forgiving your brother. Then the one seeking retribution at this point says, oh Allah, then I have indeed forgiven him. And Allah replies, if that is so, then take the hand of your brother and admit him to Jannah and both of you go in together. And that point, Rasulullah you know, teaching the companion says, fear Allah and reconcile between yourselves for indeed Allah loves this and will therefore reconcile amongst the Muslims on the day of judgment. Now, my brothers and sisters, each and every one of us, regardless of what our belief is, we will find ourselves together on the day of judgment in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a lesson that Prophet sallallahu is teaching us uh, about forgiveness and mercy and justice, even when we are wronged. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran so that we may live our lives under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I, I hope you find benefit from this beautiful name of Allah. The hadith that I just now mentioned um, struck, struck me with, with awe. Um, not because it was a long hadith, but because it is a lesson that the Prophet ﷺ is trying to teach us about uh, forgiveness, about strength, because it takes strength and courage when you're wrong to find a way to forgive. But that is the lesson the Prophet ﷺ was trying to teach the companions in that particular example. And in Surah Al Mumtahana, um, Al verse number eight, we are told, In the Laha, you hibbul muksateen. In the Laha, you hibbul muksateen. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. And muksateen is again one who acts justly. So, this verse, even in the Quran, is instructional for us. You know, we are being told that Allah loves those who act with justice and equity. So if we were in a classroom, for example, and the teacher were to tell us that the best way to get an A in this class is to bring candies to the teacher. What will happen? Everyone will bring candies to the teacher. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we can grow closer to Allah by being just and equitable in our dealings. And we can go further by doing justice to others and encouraging others to do the same not only gives us the rewards for our actions, but it also gives us a share in the rewards of the actions of those who follow us. And there is another authentic hadith narrated by Abu Juhayfa and recorded in Sunan Ibn Majah that Rasulullah said, whoever introduces a good practice that is followed after him will have a reward for that and the equivalent of their reward without um, detracting from the reward in the slightest. So whoever introduces an evil practice that is followed after him will bear the burden of the sin for that and the equivalent of their burden of sin without detracting from the burden in this life. So Allah, so as the Prophet is also teaching us that if you do good and others follow you, there is a reward for you in the effort of others as well. And if you do something that is you know, haram or goes against the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will also bear the burden of the of the sin that comes along with um, with others following you in that. And given the times that we're in and the uh, hurt we feel as a community, you know there is there is certainly something that we all can take away from these messages of justice and equity, and just having it within our hearts and holding space within our hearts to reject injustices and to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to help us become instruments of helping right those injustices is is at least the minimum we can all do within ourselves within our abilities and may Allah always give us the strength to reject that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make us instruments of justice and equity for all those who are in need of justice and equity in this world inshallah may Allah accept our good deeds and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts towards him uh in the muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat وقانتين وقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشئين والخاشئات 
والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات وذاكرين الله كثيرا وذاكرات عد الله لهم مغفرة واجرا واجرا عظيما ربنا حب لنا من ازواجنا وزرياتنا كرة عيوننا وجعلنا من المتقين اماما ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الابرار ربي جل مكيم الصلاة ومن زرياته ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب ربنا لا تزل قلوبنا بعد اي سديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة انك انت الوحاد ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنة للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا انك انت العزيز الحكيم ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وانت خير الراحمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان والإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين اللهم آمين